Hello. Hello. Um, I have missed my slot with the... I've done something anyway. I was supposed to... I scheduled this to start at seven o'clock and the software that i use says that i've got to do it within 10 minutes or it deletes it or something i don't know if you've seen hi khan thanks for being here i don't know if you see something on facebook um that says at six o'clock or whenever i did it five o'clock says i'm going to go live at seven o'clock and this is the questions and i type out all the spiel you know um but then if you're more than seven, 10 minutes late and it was seven ten, bang on. Anyway, I'm not going to make excuses. I was late. All right. Um, and then it says it's deleted your broadcast. So all that big paragraph that I wrote. So I just wrote this time. Just Facebook live. I've got questions, but um, I didn't write them all in the in the uh, paragraph because I. Uh... Anyway, well, <laughs> Not, not sure how relevant all this is. Um, I'm going to just do this now. Um, <laughs> um, just explain. I, d I don't know what happens on Facebook in terms of that being deleted. That previous broadcast that I said I was doing at seven, it says it's deleted. Um, but anyway, I'm doing it now. Uh, hi, Fiona. Fiona Danielle. Danielle Fiona. Oh, what's Khan saying? We saw it and thought you was tying the kids up in the basement. Thank you, Khan. Um, close. I was doing dinner. I'm doing dinner. I am multitasking because my wife's going out tonight and her friend's here. And I'm supposed to be doing dinner. And the, I've done it all, but the roast potatoes are still being cooked. So I'm hoping that someone back there is going to deal with that. Um, it's a big hope because they're going to be ready in seven. Well, I say seven minutes. They're probably ready now. Um, so I just hope that they're going to get them out. Otherwise, it could be all hell breaking loose out there but anyway you know priorities got to get this done so i'm here but i was yeah i knew it would do that anyway so here we do here we do it and um, we've got some good questions coming in lastminute.com so i do i do thank you for getting some questions in because i didn't have many at six o'clock and i put a call out and uh got some questions so go, there you go this question here i missed last week so I'm very sorry about that. I put it in the paragraph bit and then I was looking back and I thought, hold on a minute. I didn't ask that. I didn't answer that question. Can you, you, can we use I, ideal implants? What alternatives do you offer? I, um, full disclosure, I had to Google it, ideal implants. Um, I don't know if I should make out so I know all this stuff, but uh, I had to Google it and it's basically, um, it's basically a, uh, a saline implant, I think, by the looks of it. And there's a big sort of table as to why they're good and all this sort of stuff and uh, why they're better than um, silicone implants. And there's a big table also with all the surgeons that do it and everything. I think it's a bit American. I think they seem to be quite weighted in America. I think they most of the surgeons are American. Um, I always say to people, I can use any implants you want. I'm not tied to any implant manufacturer. We're not like some clinics where they have a deal with a certain manufacturer, so they only use those ones. We use any. And I always say to people, be a bit careful if someone says that they're the best implant, because if they were the best, we'd all use them. Um, so having said we can use any, any implant, sometimes the hospitals um, are limited to who they have on their... Um, sort of, you know, like a, a formulary. A formulary is really for drugs, but uh, who they have on their list of suppliers type thing. And we contacted the hospital and they don't have these ideal implants on the list of suppliers. So having said I can use any implants, I can't use ideal implants, I'm afraid. Um, ideal is like a, a trade name. I can use saline. Say I, we should use the we, since it's not just me. Um, I can't, you know, we can use saline implants. So the ideal implants are saline implants. So we definitely can use saline implants. Saline implants haven't really taken off in the UK. They are mainly really in America. Um, they use them a lot more in America because they used to use, um, because silicone implants were banned for a long time in America. So they, they used a lot of saline implants. So they've got a lot of experience using saline implants. And now they, um, 
uh, are using say a silicone again, but they still do use saline. So in this country, silicone implants were never black banned. So we've always used silicone. And to be honest with you, we don't use many saline implants. Um, having said, I, I sh you've got to be wary about people saying one's better. I think silicone are better. <laughs> um, but no, there are pro no, no, there are pros and cons because people do use saline. So let's be let's be balanced about this. I've got to say, not the only reason I say that because I haven't got much experience of it personally. Saline, not many people that uh, when I was training and everything, we no one uses saline implants. Saline implants are like a sort of bag of saline, and what well, they are, they're not even like a bag of saline. They are a bag of saline. They've got a silicone shell. So some people say I don't want any silicone in my body. They still got a silicone shell, but the contents are saline. The there's a lot of rippling with saline implants, as you can imagine, a sort of bag of water. They sort of got no substance to them. Um, silicone implants have got more substance. I don't know if you've ever seen a silicone implant cut in two and it still keeps its form like a jelly. So there's no substance to it because it's saline. Um, so rippling is a problem. So they pretty much always go underneath the muscle. So you will often hear in America, they talk a lot more about uh, putting implants under the muscle than we do in the UK. But that's because saline pretty much always have to be under the muscle. Um, I did. I looked at this uh, when I was going to ask the question last week. So um, I was just thinking that they had a sort of um, the pros and cons of saline and, and things like that, uh, or, or ideal that the, the company were, were doing this. But basically, saline implants versus silicone. And one of the things they said, something like um, silent rupture, um, silicone implants, yes. Saline implants, no. Saline implants don't get a silent rupture. As if to say that was a bad thing, that um, silicone implants can have a silent rupture. I think it's marginal. I think that's probably the way they want to look at it. I, I would say it's not necessarily a bad thing. A silent rupture is basically a rupture where you don't know it's ruptured. So what will happen is you'll have a, maybe a breast lump or a bit breast pain or something like that, or some reason to have a scan of your breast. And they incidentally discovered that your implant is, is ruptured. Um, so you had no symptoms. Now, for me, the, pro the, the thing is, because they're form stable silicone implants, you often don't know if the shells failed, if the shell just sort of ruptures you often don't know you don't, may not have any symptoms of that of a silent rupture um and that's not necessarily a bad thing because the silicone hasn't leaked it's kept its shape saline implants obviously if the shell fails of a saline implant it just leaks the saline leaks out and they deflate so it's obvious so you could argue that's a bad thing that they you know deflate um so uh yeah but um so yeah, so we can't use ideal implants in answer to that question. So the alternatives we offer would be saline implants of another manufacturer, which would be manufacturers like Nagel, Mentor, Allergan. Um, these are manufacturers that I know that the hospitals do, um, you know, have a, you know, not stock, but can get sort of thing. So we can use saline implants, uh, not ideal implants in particular, but um, I've not heard of them. I don't think they're big in the UK. I've never really heard anyone uh, talk about them or use them, um, but we can use saline implants, but we'd have to have a big discussion with you about saline implants um, because there are pros and cons with them. And if the pros outweigh the cons, then go for it. And saline implants might be a good option. Oh, what's going on here? Something's got this all kicking off in the chat here. Um, what First time watching it live, so this should be interesting. Yeah, Fiona Danielle. I hope it will be interesting. I hope you're not disappointed. Not much goes on, Fiona. It's just uh, me answering questions. But anyway, let's not be negative about it. Let's, you know, let's make it interesting. Let's get it happening. Evening, Joni. Joni is saying, sent you a question, but can't, can I post it again if it didn't arrive? Uh, yeah, it didn't arrive, Juni. Or if it's not, oh, I didn't do the list, did I? Let me think, Juni. Did, yeah, post it again, Juni. Um, Fiona straight in. First time I hear people. Let's welcome her. Welcome, Fiona. Nice to have you on board. Fiona has got a question. If I have had a capsule contracture, think spelt wrong. Yes, it is spelt wrong, but doesn't matter. Are you prone to this when replacing implants? This happened to me when you replaced my PIP implants, which you didn't originally give me. Um, you must have changed your name, Fiona. Have you? Fiona Danielle. That doesn't. Fiona. Yes. Anyway, um, so I replaced your implants. Good. So yes, Fiona, um, you are correct in what you say. You are 
prone to this when replacing implants yes so what you do uh actually actually my next question is about this look at this um what you do when you replace implants is you well what you do well let's strip it back let's get straight back capsular contracture is scar tissue around the implant scar tissue forming around the implant making the implant feel hard making the implant uncomfortable and that well that's why you need to have them changed or you don't need to have them changed you may want to have them changed because it's uncomfortable capsular contracture is uncomfortable would this be better a bit higher no um, so that's what capsular contracture is. So well, you can treat capsular contracture by removing that hard scar tissue, removing that capsule and putting new implants in, but that causes more scar. Every time we do anything as surgeons, we create scar. That's all we do all day long. We're creating scar. So we cause more scar tissue every time we do surgery. So if you have a capsulectomy, if you have the scar tissue removed, that is quite a traumatic operation and it creates more scar tissue. So if you have implants in, how long do you have them in? If you have implants in like 10 years, 20 years, you know, 15 years, and then you have them replaced, your risk of capsule contracture is higher second time round. You know, it might be 10 years first time, five years the second time, or 15 years first time, then 10 years the second, because you've got more scar tissue, because you've got had a second operation, and then a third, and then, a, you know, that's the problem with capsule contracture, it can, you know, vicious circle. So you always say to people, or I always say to people, if you've got a bit of a capsular contracture, obviously you have PIP implants last time, so you're probably thinking, God, I've got to get these changed. But if you've got a bit of, have, have you got a capsule contracture? I have had a capsule contracture. So if you have got a bit of a capsule contracture, Fiona, I normally say to people, leave it as long as you can. Now, I would always say, come and see me if you're worried. So come and see me if you're worried. You know, um, if you think, oh, what is this? Feels a bit hard. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure, lumpy and all that sort of stuff. Come and see, get it checked out. Let's have a look at it and see what's going on. But if it is a capsular contracture, what I would say to you is, is there's absolutely nothing to worry about. It's sort of normal, really. It's your body's reaction to the implant. Your body is forming a cap uh, a scar tissue around the implant and then that scar tissue gradually over contracts over time and because the implant's squidgy it sort of contracts and make it makes it feel hard makes it look round makes it look globular goes into a ball goes into a sphere it's got the uh, most efficient sort of surface areas of volume ratio a sphere that's why a bubble you know when you're blowing bubbles that's why they're bubbles because that's the sort of that's the sort of shape things get into um so um it forms a, so it can look quite quite round and then it gets hard. But if it's not bothering you too much, leave it. Leave it as long as you can. Because when you put new implants in, then they will start to get another capsule. And then you can get a vicious circle. And then it's, then you have them changed. And then you have more scar tissue, more scar tissue. So leave it as long as you can. And the other thing, if you're having problems with capsule contracture, is to think about polyurethane implants, which is the foam ones, which have got a lower risk of capsule contracture. So... Um, Oh, blimey, that's a good, good question there from Junie, I can see out there. Um, so, yeah, that's a good question, Fiona. Thank you for that. But if you're who I think you are with a different surname, I think, I think you, 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 yeah, come and see me. Come and see me in the clinic. Or maybe Danielle's not your surname. Maybe it's your middle name. Um, anyway, but this links with this question here. Here. Here changing breast implants. So um, this is a question who, it was in the, it was in the thing last week, but I, she's the patient, the person then said, I didn't answer the question. I didn't see it last week. Sorry about that. Did I think you might have posted it after I did the thing, but anyway, after I did the broadcast, I try and go through them and ask the questions. And I can see Roxana's got a question there and Junie. So we're going to get onto that definitely. But um, what we're going to do here is I just better do this because this patient, first of all, said, can you tell me how much it costs for breast implants? So we say, OK, yeah, tell me how much it costs for breast implants. Um, you know, send your coat and things. Uh, oh, I should have researched this. I think it's about five and a half thousand pounds to have breast implants put in. But then you say, um, how much do you charge for implants? I've already had them done for 11 years, need new ones. So then you get a bit like, oh, hold on a minute. You have had implants before. So this is replacement of implants. So replacement of implants is a little bit different. And I always uh sort of worry a bit when we get a bit cagey with prices you know i mean i'm the same when someone says prices from 
you're always saying, hold on a minute, what do you mean from? You're going to get there and it's going to be a lot more expensive and things. Why are you saying from? Why can't you just tell me what the price is? Um, the problem with when someone says, I've had implants in 11 years, can you tell me what the price is? We can give you an idea of what the price is, but it depends because you might need stuff done. Sometimes people think changing implants, that should be really easy. Take someone's set of implants in, put another set, of, uh, take one set out, put another set in. And it can be easy, to be honest with you, it can be easy, but it's often not easy because there's often stuff you need to do. The stuff you might need to do to the pocket. Um, uh, if you're changing the size of the implants, if you're going bigger or smaller. So if you're going bigger, obviously you need to expand the pocket to accommodate the bigger implant. But if you're going smaller, you've got a big pocket then. So you've got to close down the pocket so that the new implant doesn't move about all over the place. And particularly, you know, just go laterally because it will tend to go laterally and then give you a wide cleavage and stuff. So if you're going smaller, it actually can be more difficult because then you have to need, need to close down the pocket. If you're going from a teardrop, sorry, from a round to a teardrop implant, that can be a problem because you've got a big pocket then that can spin round. That's a that's an issue. Do you need a capsulectomy? That's a massive question. Do you need a capsulectomy? The price is a lot more expensive if you have a capsulectomy. So you might think, oh, I'll just take the implants out, put a new one in. You normally need to do something to the capsule. I did a blog post about this a while ago. You have to do something to the capsule when you're changing implants, whether it be a capsulography, which means closing the capsule down, closing the pocket down, maybe closing it down laterally to make the implants sit more medially if they're not sitting quite right or if they're sitting too high or too low, you know, lowering the capsule. Um, so you might need to do a capsulotomy, which means making a sort of scoring the capsule or a capsulectomy, which means removing all the capsule. Capsulectomy, just so if that's someone who's got capsular contracture or if you're changing, for instance, if you're changing from uh, silicone to polyurethane implants, you need to make a total capsulectomy because you need to have a, a, a sort of like a raw surface for the capsule for the polyurethane implants to sort of in in um, embed into the tissues that's how they work you you don't really put them into an old capsule because then they won't uh, they won't um, incorporate is that the right word they won't um, I'm going to say incorporate incorporate into the tissues so you have to do a capsulectomy then and so a capsulectomy is a big op you know a capsulectomy and change of implants takes about three hours you know, putting implants in is about an hour. So it's, it's a big op for a capsulectomy. You often need drains. You might need to be in hospital for longer. So it can be a big op. So exchange of implants is a bit of a, a bit of a, a variable thing and really something you need to, to um, for us to assess you and give you an idea of a quote of how much it's going to cost. If it's just a straightforward in and out, which it rarely is, it will be the, uh, whatever it is, five, five, four, seventy, I think it is, for just for the, which is the price for breast or implants. Um, but if it's a capsulectomy, I don't know what it is, but it's a lot more if it's a capsulectomy. So always feel a bit cagey when you say, oh, price is five, four, seventy. And then you come and say, oh, sorry, price is, you know, whatever it is, eight now. Or I don't know what it is, but a lot more. You think, Hold on a minute. You told me it'd be this. And you're like, oh, yeah, we've got a capsulectomy. So that's why change of implants is a bit like a bit funny about price thing, because it depends on the, what you do with the capsule, really. So. Um, I'm, I'm losing losing it here on the thing. Uh, Roxana's got in here. Roxana Changizi. How long do implants last realistically? Really good question, Roxana. I mean, you've got to think, what would you need implants changed for? These days, they're pretty good in terms of rupture. Rupture's not that common. And also because they're form stable, they feel a bit firmer than the old implants. Even if they do rupture, like I was saying earlier, the silent rupture, you know, it's less of an issue. So the main problem is capture the contracture. And the, the, the um, thing about capture the contracture is that I normally say to, to people, it takes about five or 10 years for it to happen, 15 to 20% of patients with silicone implants will have a capsule contracture at 10 years. So one in five, about a bit less than one in five, will have a capsule contracture. Four in five will be fine at 10 years. And then it goes up one to 2% per year. Now, just because you've got a capsule contracture doesn't mean you have to have it changed. A lot of people say they've got to be changed every 10 years. They haven't got to be changed every 10 years. But around 10 years, you might start to feel that it goes a bit bit hard and you might want to have it changed so and as i say that can be an expensive operation especially if you need a capsulectomy so that's something to factor in if you're having implants i think around five or ten years you've got to think about having them changed but you don't have to have them changed the first person who had implants put in in 1960 whatever has still got them in you know 50 years later so they're probably really hard but you don't have to have them changed but i think it, you should plan and sort of budget to, to have them changed 
Uh, less so with polyurethane implants, the foam coated one, they're much less likely to go hard. It's one of the big benefits of them. But uh, still, I think you have got to think that you will, may well need um, another surgery um, in the future. But it's hard to give you a say that they last this long, you know. Can you have implants if you have biggish boobs? Yes, you can. Uh, absolutely, you can. And if you have biggish boobs, actually, this I make a lot of big deal. A, a big, a lot of big deal. I make a big deal about um, uh, uh, profile. I say the profile is really important. The shape is really important. Actually, if you've got big boobs, it's less important because then you're just enhancing the breasts that you've got. So the shape is less important because you've got your natural breast on top of the implants. But there might be some things about shape. Particularly, if you've got very big breasts. If they're sitting low, then you've got to think, oh, the implants can be here, the breasts can be there, then you know you get into things like lifts and things. But uh, in principle, yeah, you can, no problem at all. Um, Junie's come out with a big one here. Is it fitting in the thing? Can I ask, I'm going to peer over the top here. Can I ask, what is your opinion on Galaflex, Stratis, Surgimend, and Breform as a way of lifting and keeping the breast lifted? I've had two ops with respected surgeons in the UK to revise the botched breast lift done in Poland. But both times the result there, uh, sorry, the result has been short-lived and I wondered whether one of these structures would be a solution for me. Um, Junie, you poor thing. This is one, it's just a problem, isn't it? Bre breast implant surgery can be a problem you know when you get into problems you get into problems um and this is tricky this is tricky territory when you get into revisions you as i say every time you do surgery you're getting scar tissue we're fighting against scar tissue um you know it's a tricky one this junie because it depends on what your issue what your problem is but these things um the galaflex stratus surgery and all these bits and bobs um are useful and can be useful and they're really useful in revision surgery like what you're describing and it depends on what your issue is i've said that already haven't i um so what they are is they're like um uh, they're like um supportive tissue uh, it's like a dermal matrix and a dermal support. It's a supportive piece of, they're like a, sh a sheet of stuff, which um, is something to give support. So the two main areas you can use them are one, if you have got lack of cover over the implant. So the first, so if you get rippling, basically, if you've got a lot of rippling, you see the implant, things like that, then you can use them to put in the layer between the implant and the skin. To give you a bit of cover over the implant um the first thing probably we put it under the muscle but uh, the muscle just covers the sort of this area here so this area here might be a problem so you can use them in that area there use them a lot for breast reconstruction when patients haven't got any tissue to cover the implant so you often use the muscle in the top half and use these stratus or surgimend or whatever in the lower border to cover the implant so that's one good way of using them the other good way of using them is uh, for supporting the uh, implant or keeping the implant in position. So one of the problems is if you've had surgery and you've had problems with the surgery, if the pocket's been made too big, it's really hard to stop um, the, the implant going into the pocket. So problems like uniboob, synmastia, when you get a web between the breasts, really hard pocket. Once the pocket's been made, if the implants have been put in too big, too wide, and you've got a pocket between the breasts and one breast goes to the other and you get a web between, it's not a good look. It's really hard to sort of close down that and stop the, you know, changing the implants and stop it from going across. Um, similarly, laterally, stop it, you know, to support it and stop it from moving. So these sort of surgimend or these stratus, these, these materials can you be used to close down the pocket and to support the implant, um, to, to, to support the, the pocket, just to keep the pocket a certain size, uh, which might be why you're, oh, here we go. And lip, sorry, you said they're lifting and keeping the breast lifted um so yeah the other thing is if you're trying to keep them up if they're descending too low so if the pocket's been made too low and you're trying to close the pocket inferiorly you can use them um the problem with with them sometimes particularly if you're trying to keep the breast lifted is you are always fighting against gravity and again if that inframemory fold is too low if it's been closed if it's if it's been made too low you're always fighting against gravity and you've got to think what you're going to anchor these things to because it's all very well having a non-forgiving tissue you know sheet of tissue that lifts the breast but if that non-forgiving sheet of tissue is not anchored securely the whole lot will descend so you have to anchor it to the bone and you have to anchor it very securely 
to make sure that it doesn't descend because if it descends the whole lot's you know it doesn't matter that it's not forgiving because it's just like a whole lot goes down so um a couple of things about them they are expensive these sheets are expensive pieces of material so if you get into operations with these they are expensive they are they often have to be anchored well and that could be uncomfortable if you're anchoring it to bone and things like that that can be a little bit uncomfortable uh if they get infected it's another implant so obviously the implant itself is an implant but this is sort of like an implant it's a foreign body so it's a nightmare if they get infected or it can be a nightmare if they get infected um can be bad news just like it's bad news if an implant gets infected and it's a bad place to be junie i've got to say in my experience and just talking about my experience here i can't talk for anyone else i think if you have problems with implants and pockets and positions and all these sorts of things polyurethane implants are really good because they don't you know synmastia and positioning they don't sort of move as much as silicone implants so for cases of sort of botched or um that's a bad word isn't it so cases where the pocket's been made too big or the pocket's not right uh, it can be really hard to make the pocket right um, uh, and then put another silicone implant in which the silicone implant doesn't really sort of stay where you put it but polyurethane implants can solve a lot of problems because they don't move around in the same way the silicone implants too again you have to do a total capsulectomy as i said a minute ago so it's, it's a big operation total capsulectomy and then a polyurethane implant and positioning that just right can often be a good option so that might be something to think about joni uh, juni so but you've got to think if you've had two ops with respected surgeons already you've got to think you know you're subjecting your breast to a lot of surgery so you've got to be really worried about having more surgery juni and i do feel for you there and you know you take on these things like these dermal templates these stratus and what have you the surgeon but you're adding into an extra level of complexity um, i'm sure the surgeons would have known about this before but they didn't use them for you know for reasons um so really tricky when you get into revisions junie and um they've got a place but you know you've got to think about what you're using them for and you've got to take on the risks tracy's in the house good evening tracy uh fiona is saying it's her with a different surname i think i know who you are fiona yeah nice to see you and i'll see you soon i think probably debbie good evening sorry i'm late tuning in tonight don't worry i was late too debbie don't worry about it helen good to see you why can't you just have them in and out helen says well you can helen and sometimes hardly ever sometimes you you do but unless you're having the same size in and out but even if you're having the same size in and out unless you're having just a little bit bigger you can maybe it's often good to go a little bit bigger you can maybe just do a bit of a capsulotomy and just it's it you know it, you can helen you can occasionally have them just in and out but why are you having them in and out why don't you just leave the ones you got you know if you you know there's usually something so you know if you want to go a bit bigger then you have to obviously make the big pocket bigger to accommodate that big one if you want to go a bit smaller you have to close down the pocket so it doesn't rattle around in that big pocket so you usually need to do something helen but having said that it might just be the same as a press augmentation price the really expensive price is really when you need to do a capsulectomy so it might not be the really expensive price but um i'm just you know saying that's why if you've asked for a price we might have said you from you know so Jade says hi. Hi Jade, nice to see you. Debbie's straight in here. How would you know if you stitch a muscle repair too tight? I am reading lots of comments about the MR. Yeah, capital letters. That's how you do it, Debbie. Do it in capital letters if you're using abbreviations. Otherwise, it looks like Mister. All right. The muscle repair, obviously, being the most painful part of TT. Tummy tuck. There you go. And what are the disadvantages of not having MR with TT? So uh, you can't really stitch it too tight, uh, Debbie. Can you? Can you stitch it too tight? I mean, you just got to stitch it together. I mean, there's a line between the rectus muscles called the linear alba. It's too tight, sort of overlapping them. Um, so I don't think, I'm not sure if you can stitch it too tight. But um, but um, 
So, yeah. Um, but having said that, if it is very uh, far apart, it can be really uncomfortable. You're absolutely right about the MR being the most painful part of TT. You're absolutely right, Debbie. And what um, you can do, we often, we usually put local anesthetic in the rectus sheath to, uh, to uh, combat that because often the rectus repair can be the most, uh, most uncomfortable thing. Um, so it's about putting local in there, um, Debbie, but uh, positioning it too tight is, is usually an issue. Uh, I mean, if you had a really wide diverification, you're really stitching it tight, you'd worry about sort of compromise being at a pre, you know, respiratory compromise. The anesthetist would say to you, wait a minute, mate, you're doing that a bit tight. Can't breathe because you're squishing your abdominal contents. It's never happened. I don't think you, you know, but um, that, anyway. That's for someone who's got big hernia and you're replacing the hernia, that can happen sometimes. But for a tummy tuck, that's not really an issue. So if you had said that, that doesn't really happen. What are the disadvantages of not having an MR with a TT? Well, I guess if you've got a di diverification, the disadvantage is you still got it. But if you haven't got a diverification, and not everyone has, if you've got good muscles, sometimes people have got really good muscles and they're not splayed apart. Um, then, then there's there's no disadvantage of not having a muscle repair. There's a disadvantage of having a muscle repair because it can be uncomfortable and it can be complications because you're putting stitches in. You use a you use either a long term dissolving sutures or a permanent suture. There are certainly disadvantages of doing a, a muscle repair. So I put it more the other way, um, Debbie. There's no disadvantage of not having one. If you don't need one, don't have one. You know, you don't hundred percent need one. Um, so don't uh, you know? Don't worry if you don't need one. It's great. Oh, yeah, don't need the muscle. Jade is in. How much longer is recovery for breast surgery under the muscle? Good question, Jade. I normally say to people that uh, I give them time scales for breast uh, um, surgery recovery. And I say two weeks gentle exercise. First two weeks, first week, not much. Second week, bit more, you know, computer and stuff. After two weeks, exercise, bike, you know, getting out and about a bit. And then four to six weeks before anything heavy with your arms. But that's the same if it's under or over the muscle. I don't think there's like a weak difference or like that. It's the, it is generally worse when you're under the muscle, but there's sort of like, it's like two curves. Generally it's worse when it's under the muscle and it's better when it's over the muscle. But sometimes people have it over the muscle and they have a lot of pain. Sometimes people have it under the muscle and they have no, they think, well, oh, it's fine, nothing to worry about. So it's not like 100% that it's like terrible under the muscle and brilliant over. Um, there is a sort of overlap and it's not like massively worse under the muscle. I'd give the same time scales when people are having it over or under. Um, so it's it's not like it's tangibly longer under, but it's generally a little bit more uncomfortable. Roxana, thank you. Shirley, long time no see. Good to see you tonight. Jade, good evening. Junie, no implants. Oh, just recurred droopy breasts and wide cleavage. Ah, Junie, so you're, you're, you're talking about um, these things like the internal bra, basically, that you're using these things, um, all sorts of things. There's that cone shaped thing and there's all the uh, these. Um, you know what, Junie, I don't think there is anything. We, we spoke about this at the ISAPS meeting. Of, uh, when was it? October, was it? Um, and in my view, you cannot get sustained up i'm going to make a statement here you cannot get sustained upper pole fullness with natural breast tissue just can't do it it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna settle i won't say droop settle and i think you know for me it's all about telling people that before they have a mastopexy i'm not saying there's no point in doing a mastopexy because you can dramatically improve the shape with a mastopexy but you have to accept that that fullness in the upper pole will settle and you will get a concavity in the upper pole and some people say, I don't like that. I want more fullness in the upper pole. You cannot get it. That's it. I can't personally, I can't do it. And you've just shown you've had two operations, three operations, botch this and that. You cannot do it. Now, this is out of a bra. You can wear a bra and push them up and do things like that with a bra and what have you, but you cannot do it. The only way to get sustained fullness in the upper pole is with an implant, like a breast implant, not, not these sort of dermal things. But you might say, I don't want to be bigger and I don't want to risk of implants. I'm like, fine. I don't think you should have one then. But I think you just have to accept the shape, Judy, is my advice on that one. I don't, I mean, I think it's without seeing you. I mean, white cleavage should be um, something that you might be able to fix, but you've got to respect the boundaries of the breast. You've got to look at your breast pre op. So if you had a wide cleavage pre op, you've got to respect that. You can't really put breast where it wasn't. Um, you know, often wide cleavage is a problem when people have it under the muscle, have implants under the muscle and they're splayed wide and they look abnormally wide. But what I normally say is you've got to look at the 
boundaries of the breast pre-op and that's where they will where, where they will be post-op so often when you have a lift they're like flat and then the cleavage is enhanced but the actual distance between is the same but it's sort of enhanced so um tricky one there Junie I would be a bit worried about chasing this fullness in the upper pole because obviously you wear bra and wear clothes have I said that already you can wear bra and you know and you can make them sit higher thanks hun you're welcome hun how do I see you make appointment, Helen? Um, well, Helen, you can come to my clinic, but you can't see me. We well, can see me. But I'm around and I'll say hello, but it'll be Kurum. It'll be Kurum Khan who is seeing all the new patients now. Well, no, Azan's seeing the new patients as well, but Azan's doing the um, skin. So uh, Kurum's seeing all the breast patients. So Helen, you'd be more than welcome to come and see Kurum, but I'm not taking any new patients because I am building the clinic and I am putting in um i'm putting in the time to build the systems work with the surgeons so we say this is how we do it this is the best way to do things so i'm trying to build that up so um helen you are welcome to come to the clinic and it will be under my auspices but uh yeah i'm not really seeing new patients jade thank you i have i can't remember what you were saying jade now about you have but i'm glad that you have how much longer is the thing under the muscle was it Fiona, I will obviously I'll see you, Fiona, because you're my patient. Can you have a breast uplift if you've already had one years ago? Yes, you can, Fiona. Great question. We've had that um, about breast reduction a while ago. You have to know uh, who did, uh, not who did it, but you have to know sort of how they did the uplift before. If it's, if you, if it's like 20 years ago, it might be okay. But nevertheless, it's always an uplift's less of an issue than a reduction. The reason I'm saying that is because you isolate the nipple somehow. You're obviously moving the nipple with an uplift. And when you isolate the nipple first time round, all the way around it is scar tissue apart from one pedicle, one stalk. And you want to use the same pedicle second time round, because if you sort of keep the nipple attached, say, on a superior pedicle first time, and then second time round you make an inferior pedicle and you cut that superior pedicle, then the nipple pedicle is based on scar. I don't know if I've made that up, I don't know if I'm getting too technical there. But anyway, basically, it's good to know how it was done first time. When you do an uplift, you you don't you do mobilize the breast quite a lot, but not quite as much as a reduction. So it's less of an issue with an uplift than a reduction. I've got to be honest. But if you do know um, who did your surgery or what hospital you did your surgery in, we can usually write to them and say, look, can we have the copy of the op note? They're usually pretty good. But um, so you definitely can have an uplift. But doing any sort of revision surgery is a bit always a bit sort of um, more complications but it's certainly possible junie breasts hung in front before being botched but he cut right up the middle and took skin from the middle making them fall sideways oh my lord that sounds ooh. give me the heebie-jeebies um right so okay mm, so okay if it was all right for before maybe it's okay um jade thank you i've surgery but with kuram khan in january can't wait he's great and made me feel very comfortable jade look at that now that's not kuram is it with a fake account called jade curtis kuram i've told you about this that's not right get off come on get off let's have real people no no it's not kuram. of course it's not jade thank you that's that's the sort of publicity we need thank you jade he is great and uh i'll tell you something i could a lot of people who want to work at the clinic um, because basically I'm saying to everybody come and see Kuram instead of me so that's quite a big thing because uh, if he wasn't good then I would be not you know perceived to not be good this is the whole thing I say about the clinic if you come and the receptionist is rude or the nurse is rude or something like that everyone says oh it's not your fault i understand you're a good surgeon it's not your fault it is it is sort of reflect does reflect on me all that reflects on me so i've got to be careful about who the reception who the nurse all that sort of stuff is because it all reflects on the practice so even more so when i'm getting surgeons in you know i've got to be careful with what surgeons i get in so um Kuram is fantastic and uh, i am very comfortable with Kuram as well i work with him and i've seen his results and i've operated with him and he's really really happy that uh, he's working in the clinic so J jade you're in good hands um fiona 14 years ago okay well that's good that's a good length of time ago but still i think if you can find out what the or let, let me know and we can try and find out who or what the uh, pedicle was first time it would be better 
not a deal breaker, but better. You just be a bit more careful about the, not a bit more careful, obviously you're careful every time, but you might maybe not lift the nipple as much. You may, I mean, it depends on how much of a lift you need. You might be a bit more conservative about how much you lift if you don't know the pedicle of the old one. And I'd have to warn you, your risks are greater if you don't know the pedicle of the old one. So, you know, it's good to know, but 14 years is good. You've had it a long, you know, you've had a lot of time for that, you know, blood supply to grow through the scar if you did um, base the nipple on scar. That makes sense. Also, Jonathan, you grafted my nipples and put them too high. So not really after upper bulb fullness, but lifting the breast to make the nipples appear in a better place. I gotcha. I've got you. When breasts drop, nipples stay where they were. I've got you, Junie. I've got you. I'm hearing that loud and clear. Um, I am hearing that loud and clear. The position of the nipple is so important. It's so important. You can have a breast in normal shape, but the nipple's too high. It just looks weird. If it's too low, it doesn't look good. And the, it's just terrible, isn't it, Junie, when it's too high? Really bad. And I've got to be honest, Junie, it's really hard to correct to you know when a nipple's too low it's quite hard to it's quite easy to make it higher but once it's too high difficult problem juni difficult problem much more difficult to lower a nipple than higher a nipple it sounds like what you've got is something called pseudotosis um <clears throat> i don't know if you've heard that term pseudotosis when the nip tosis is a droop but it's often uh, diagnosed by the position of the nipple saying, oh, if you've got really bad ptosis, your nipple's really low. But sometimes people have a nipple which is in an okay position or in a high position, and their breasts sort of look droopy. That's called, that's pseudotosis. So they've got too much breast below the nipple. So, um, so you know, you need to get that volume up to try and rebalance the breast. But really tricky, Junie, really tricky. And I don't have to tell you that. Um, never going to Poland for so long. Mm. Well, I'm sure there are good people in Poland. But uh, obviously not, not your one, but probably others. I don't want to be slanderous to a nation. Um, when I when I started these um, earlier on today, um, or was it yesterday? Anyway, when I said to them, oh, not many questions, they have put this question in. <laughs> but we've had loads of questions, haven't we? We've done well. So they put this question in. So it's sort of, I don't think it's a question from my person. They just have lots of people who have been interested in it. Well, there you go. Well, that was. Um, talk about how it is a good idea to plan ahead for surgery. No, not rush decision. Okay, got to talk about that. Um, yeah, it's a good idea to, to plan ahead for surgery, not rush decision. I think that's because we have sometimes have people who say, I want surgery next week or, you know, next month and I want this date. Um, particularly, you know, obviously if it's a mole or a cyst or sort of less of a surgery but even that to be honest can be quite a big deal but certainly for big ops like you know breast surgery tummy tucks yeah absolutely definitely a good the idea to plan it people say look i'm pregnant or i've just had a child or things i'm like come to the clinic by all means talk to us never charge for follow-up appointments come to us we'll have a chat we'll make a plan but it's always good to have a plan and then we'll you know see you closer to the time because what you don't want to do is wait a year and then say right i'm ready now for my surgery can I have it next month always good to plan ahead we might say things you hadn't thought of. You might other questions might crop up after you come to the clinic. So um, it's a major life event. You don't want to be doing it again, despite what we've been talking about earlier about you know needing stuff done again and, and what have you. You really don't want to be doing surgery again if you can avoid it. So you've got to get it right first time. So yeah, it's never good to be honest when someone says I want to have surgery next month or you know next week or so. It's just like oh, I don't think that's good. It's not good. All right. About that. Tick. Now this question, who would have thought it? During a tummy tuck, uh, how is a new belly button made? You, uh, this is quite high. It might be a silly thing to discuss this later, but during a new tummy tuck, yeah. Um, you know, that's weird. I did a blog post about this. I wrote I did it on Monday. Um, exactly this. So it's not a stupid question at all because I've just done a blog post about it. I just checked them. They haven't published it yet, but they will publish it probably in the next uh, few days um so check watch the space so maybe i won't say anything i will say something so it depends on what sort of tummy tuck you have so a mini tummy, there's mini and full of the sort of main ones so if you have a mini you just take um it's usually 
uh, just a bit of tissue above the pubic area. If you have a cesarean scar, sometimes that skit scar is a bit tethered. You have a bit of fullness just above that scar in the pubic area in the lower abdomen. And a mini tummy tuck takes sort of an ellipse of skin from that, pu that uh, cesarean scar and above and pulls it down. It doesn't do anything to the belly button. So the belly button doesn't just stays where it is. Although, because if you can imagine, if you're pulling that skin down, it pulls the belly button down a little bit. But there's certainly no scars and there's no new belly button or anything like that. It's a full tummy tuck where you have to get your head around it. And what we really need to do is do a video of it. And if you notice doing more videos, um, that's what we need to do. Get to this and do a video of it so you can see exactly what happens. Because a lot of people struggle to get their head around it. Because what you do when you do a full tummy tuck, you take all the skin from the pubic area. Um, if you have got a cesarean scar, where that cesarean scar sits, to the um, belly button. So all the skin from you, you cut around the belly button. You take all that skin away, so you cut around and you dissect down the belly button. So you've got a belly button, you've got a stalk, an umbilical stalk, the stalk of the belly button from the abdominal wall to, to, to the skin. This stalk of belly button sitting there and all this skin's gone. And then what you do, in order to close the wound, you have to undermine, to go underneath all the way up to the rib cage. That's how you're able to do your rectus repair because you can see the rectus muscles. But you undermine all the way to the rib cage to pull the skin down. That's how you get it closed. Then you have to bend the table. We call it breaking the table. You have to bend the table. You're sitting up. You have pillows on your knees to bring the table really tight. Get the skin down. Pull the skin down. And then there are different ways of working out where the belly button is. But basically, you have to work out where that umbilical stalk is, which is now underneath that big flap of skin that you pulled down. It's under there somewhere. And then you make a hole in the skin and you hope you made the hole in the right place and it pops out and there it is. And then you stitch it in. Does that make sense? What I've done a blog post and what I've said is that if we can get some photos with moles, usually if you get moles are on the skin and you can see, hold on a minute, that mole was up here and now it ends up next to the belly button. You can think, hold on a minute, what's going on? That gives you an idea of how it works. I don't know if that, I don't know if that, um, I don't know if that, uh, explains it but that you it's really you need to see it i think when you see it you'll be oh yeah i get it but it's quite hard to so if you had a mold inside your belly button it would still be there when you when you've had your surgery but uh the skin around the outside is is, is skin that used to be higher up on your tummy it gets pulled down the skin inside is the same so junie says there's lots of bad ones in poland is there junie i don't know i don't know I don't know but um anyway sorry anyway in general, Junior, I tell you about going away for surgery. I always say, look, it's not good going away for surgery. Just in general, because you have a problem. It's probably hard to get hold of your surgeon, to speak to your surgeon and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it is it is just difficult when you have surgery abroad. I understand how attractive it is. It's a huge industry, massive industry. Um, so in this country, I don't know what, not huge numbers of people going abroad for surgery. I understand it. Have a holiday. It's cheaper. Um, because it is expensive in this country, um, but it's just difficult if you have problems. Um, have a bit of my book. Over here. My book. Yeah. Well, except for live from strangers. A bit about going abroad. I'm not saying everyone's bad abroad. I'm just saying it's different. It's like in this country. I say, look, don't go to. Um, don't go far in this country. Similarly, when people want to come far to to see us here in Birmingham, they say, I'm in Edinburgh, and I'm in. Uh, well, Belfast read it last week, didn't we? So, look, best to stay local if you can. Um, Gemma, mine is too high and I'm having a small amount of skin, one to two centimeters to help move it to correct position. Um, Gemma, are we on the belly button or the nipples? I'm thinking it's, I'm thinking it's belly button. I'm going belly button on this, Gemma. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to go belly button. Belly button's too high. Uh, that's interesting, Gemma. Um, because there's a guy uh, who actually always cuts the belly button off and replaces it, makes a new one. Uh, doesn't do what I just said, but he but he makes a new one, and he does that because he wants to put them higher because he feels they're more aesthetically pleasing higher. So if it is belly buttons you're talking about, not nipples, that's interesting. But if it, your belly button is too high, this then yes, you can move it you can move it down often it's not people feel it's not central when the swelling it often moves aside but you can move it up down left right it's not that easy to move and one to two centimeters sounds like a long way oh one to two centimeters uh you can move it a little bit i'm not sure about one to two centimeters but you can certainly definitely move it a bit and i hope it'll be better for you when it's in a better position 
Um, yeah. Uh, Gemma, that was Gemma. Jade, is there a minimal time of having a baby to have a tummy tuck? Uh, yes, Jade, there is. There's a couple of things. First of all, when you have a baby, you are in a hypercoagulable state. Fiona, putting kids to bed. Just saw that book. Found this very useful. Come for checkup a new year. Sorry, had to cancel the last one. Childcare issues. All the best for a great Christmas. You are a great surgeon. Boom. And you know that's not me because I'm here. So that's a real person saying that. Look at that. That's the sort of um, commendations we need. Thanks, Fiona. Um, good luck putting the children to bed. I am going to be doing that myself in a minute. Um, assuming the potatoes are out of the oven. Big assumption. Can't smell anything. Um, I think I, so, yes, uh, I will see you soon, Fiona, and don't worry about the last one. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. So, um, Jade, uh, when you have a child, you are in a hypercoagulable state. Your body wants to clot because it's preparing for having a baby, which you will bleed. So you are at risk of having clots. That is one of the problems with um, Usher, Usher's wife had a baby and then traveled to Brazil, I think it was, and had abdominal liposuction, I believe. So, and she had a DVT. She was quite short, quite soon after having a baby. So she was like hypercoagulable, coagulable, easy for you to say, because she just had a baby. She's also then got in a plane and gone to Brazil. So she, that's another thing that increases your risk of DVTs because you're sitting in a plane with your legs bent and you're not moving. Um, and she's also having surgery. I think it was just liposuction. Well, I say just, I don't know how much liposuction she was having, but then surgery is a risk factor for having a DVT. So you're multiplying up your risk for DVTs and she had a DVT. DVT can be really bad news. A DVT can be fatal. So it's a really bad thing to have a DVT. So you need to make sure you're out of that period. And a, and a tummy tuck, it's a higher risk of getting a DVT. I don't want to be too negative here, but it's a high risk of getting a DVT because you're increasing the tension on the abdomen so you're reducing the venous drainage from your legs so you're making the leg blood flow back from your legs more sluggish so you have to be there's lots of things we do to uh, to uh, combat dvts get you walking early uh put your floater on boots on stockings on heparin all these things anyway point is after having a baby your increased risk of clotting so you um need to get over that number one that's exhibit a um you also have a small baby so it's a bit of a nightmare if you have major surgery you've got a small baby to look after you also will have some degree of skin retraction after your child so you need to see how much skin retraction you have you I might, you know it might be that you don't need a tummy tuck it might be like oh crumb so i've definitely tummy tuck because i need one before or whatever but it's always best to be in the best position possible you often you might put on weight and you might have to get your weight stable so six months is the minimum in answer, in answer to your question. And I would say a year is uh, is good because the child's walking a bit more mobile. Maybe you don't have to lift so much and uh, you give everything a good time to to um, to uh, relax and settle down. So, yeah, six months is minimum. A year is ideal. Junie, I've got your book downloaded to my Kindle, but it's too late now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that, Junie. But good for downloading it. Thank you. Um, I think it's on special offer on download. Is it still? I should be promoting stuff like this on here, shouldn't I? Get my book. It's on Kindle. It's on special offer, I think. Um, it's free on, anyway, on, on Amazon, on my website, neveracceptfullyfromstrangers.com, although it's four ninety nine postage. But if you're in Birmingham, you want to come to the clinic, just come, pick one up, we'll give you one. Uh, more the merrier. And the other thing I've got to promote is this is a podcast. If anyone does podcasts, I probably don't promote that much because I don't listen to much myself, but I know people do. We do this as a podcast, this free Q&A. It's on iTunes, I think. Um, Vivian, we can't see it. Take it off the shelf. That's, that's what we need, Vivian. Let's get a bit of publicity here. Get, get the book. Never accept a lift from strangers. Jonathan Steyano. How to choose the best plastic surgeon for your cosmetic breast surgery. Yeah, that's my book. Thanks, Vivian. Uh, it's available on Amazon, but it's twelve ninety nine, I think, on Amazon. So get it on my website because I just that's good more. Um, yeah, Fiona, we've done that. Going to bed. That's good. Um, 
I and I heard, I don't know if you heard, do you hear the shouting in the background? Um, can I see a song? Right, this is because uh, just something that's come up at a minute ago, someone said um, about wants a certain type of implants and can't see a samples, worry about it. I, I think I think people do like to see samples of implants and that's okay to see samples of implants. I don't necessarily know how much it helps and how essential it is. I, th I think probably maybe not everyone has got samples. Obviously, the samples are real implants, and implants cost, you know, four or five hundred pounds. Are these ones, particularly these are B-light implants? They're really expensive. I don't know how much. Seven, eight, nine thousand pounds. I don't know. They're really expensive, basically. Um, so not everyone has got implant uh, has got samples. So I think as long as you've maybe got an idea of what an implant is, and you can see on YouTube, can't you? What they feel like? Ooh, I've, got a, I've got a whole load in a box over there, but um. Yeah, I don't think it's essential. I wouldn't really worry about that if you can't see a sample. I'm not sure if it's going to make you make the decision yes or no, because obviously when it's in, it's different to what it's like in the, you know, in in outside sort of thing. So yeah, I just wanted to mention that. How hardy are breast implants? Well, this is going back to the question earlier. How hardy are silicon implants? I cracked a rib the other day and I was terrified I ruptured an implant. How would I know? um pretty hardy you know because you i don't know if you've seen that thing on youtube where they drive a car over it they're pretty hardy they're pretty good number one and the thing you worry about is shell failure you, you normally need something like a road traffic accident or something um rupture cracking a rib can be significant trauma but you can you know hear people sneezing and cracking ribs and things like that so it depends on the de on the degree of trauma you um you know, like a road traffic accident with a seat belt and things that's the sort of trauma you need so the, what I would say to you, look, if you don't know, if it feels fine, I wouldn't worry about it. If it's keeping its shape, then I, I wouldn't worry about it. If it's changed its shape, then I think that, and you cracked a rib, so you've had significant trauma, the breast has changed shape, then it's worth getting a scan. Now, scans aren't 100%. They can sometimes say they're ruptured and they're not, and they can sometimes say they're not and they are. So you've got to be careful before. I wouldn't have a scan, you know, just for the sake of it. Um, because a lot of because implants these days, and I know this patient who's asked this question has got a form stable implant. They're form stable, so even if the shell fails, they don't leak liquid silicone. They keep their their shape. So I wouldn't worry about it. If your breast is fine and looks fine and feels fine, I wouldn't worry about it. Having said that, if you're worried, come back and see me because I know you're my patient, and I will, you know, we'll have a look and, and see what's what. But um, you know, this is what this you say. How would I know? This is the silent rupture. If it was a saline implant, you would know. It would just leak. It would just deflate. But I think that's not necessarily a bad thing for saline implants, personally. But you can make your own view on that. Um, Debbie, does your book just cover breast augmentation? I assume from the title, which is great, by the way, or is it all cosmetic surgery? It is mainly it, the reason for the title and how breast surgery thing is because of me really but uh it is it talks about surgical training and it talks about uh how to choose a surgeon so it's really any plastic surgeon but yeah i thought never accept a lift from strangers sounded good so um yeah i went down the cosmetic breast surgery route but yeah it's 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 relevant for any sort of surgery um so um yeah it's it's not just breast surgery it is relevant for any surgery but it does talk about how plastic surgery training works and what specialty training is all about and different types of surgery and um how to choose a surgeon richard having a bit of work done debbie all right okay um i'm not sure how i should read that zoe would you need to be turned during surgery for lipo to upper thighs and back hips hello uh, zoe you probably better work it out if you think yourself, you know, lie on the bed. I mean, the back of your hips, then that means you might be able to do it in, a, in what's called a prone position, which means lying face down. Um, so you might not need a turn. Nice just, well, they're not that bad, but sometimes nice just think, mm, don't like doing prone surgery. So you might do a lateral, lateral, you know, do two turns like that, do it one lateral and then the other lateral, um, or it might be able to do it prone. Don't know, Zoe. It depends on sort of the areas and think about the hips and but you might be able to get to it from all from having surgery in a prone position. Um, flying with implants. I'm going away on holiday this week. This will be the first time flying since I've had my implants. Are there any precautions I should or need to take? Thank you. 
Um, no, none whatsoever. You can fly fine. I and mean, we have a lot of patients who are air, uh, not air traffic control, because they don't fly, do they? Air stewardesses and stewards. Well, <laughs> probably not stewards. Well, there might be air stewards. I don't know. I, I don't think I've got any air stewards, actually. Um, I'll check that. I don't think I've got any air stewards. But certainly air stewardesses. We've certainly got air stewardesses who have surgery and then they fly quite soon after having surgery. It's fine. The air pressure, the cabin's pressurised. The, 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 it's fine. Uh, people worry about flying, but the, nothing's going to go off in the um, airport when you go through the, you know, go through the uh, gantry things. Um, they're not going to, they're not going to be alarms going off and you're not going to get in the aeroplane and they're not going to explode or anything like that. So no precautions whatsoever, enjoy it. The only thing about flying, the main thing is if someone's having surgery, I say, look, make sure you're healed because you don't have an infection or something. Blood, this patient's a good few months down the line. So if you're a couple of months down the line, I think you'll be fine. But you don't want to get an infection and you're in Marbella and it goes a bit red and you ring us up and say, it's a bit red, I'm a bit worried about it. So oh, come on, we'll give you some antibiotics. You're like, I'm in Marbella. And that makes it a bit difficult. But if you're uh, several months down the line, no problem, fly, enjoy it. Um, the other thing is if you're having it soon after surgery, it might be uncomfortable to carry the bags and things, but the flying specifically, absolutely no problem. So look at that. That was good. We had some good questions there. I was a bit worried. I'm not going to lie. I was a bit worried. I put the call out on the, um, on the, on the discussion, on the, um, on our own discussion forum for some questions and, uh, they did come back with some, so thank you. Oh, hold on a minute. I'm just on it now. I don't know what's happening with the camera. If you're still seeing me. Should you never sleep in your tummy if you've had a reduction and an uplift? What? Should you never sleep on your tummy? I think that is. Um, no, that's not correct. You shouldn't not. You should. You can. You can um, sleep on your tummy if you've. Look that up. Um, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I mean, when you have a certainly the, the the reduction, the uplift bit, it's going to be uncomfortable to sleep on your tummy to start with, no question about it. And so what I say to people is listen to your body, your body will tell you and if it's uncomfortable, then don't do it. Um, and, you know, um, you know, your body will tell you and if it's uncomfortable, then back off. But if it's comfortable, then you'll be fine. And um, certainly to start off with, it will be uncomfortable to sleep on your tummy after a, after a reduction. Um, but then after, you know, a few months, six, four, six months, um, you might find it's okay. And even if you don't find it okay, you might go to sleep on your side. You might wake up and you're on your tummy. Oh my God, I'm on my tummy. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Certainly the... the uh, Oh no, it wasn't a tummy tuck, it was just a reduction and uplift. Yeah, no, absolutely fine. Once you're healed, six, 12 months after after surgery, they're yours, their breasts are yours. Treat them like normal. Don't do anything differently. Sport, con uh, contact sports, things like that. Um, sleeping on your tummy, all this stuff. Yeah, you can do that, that's fine. I don't know, the way you've asked the question, I mean, someone said that you should never sleep on your tummy if you've had a ratchet and uplift, but it's not me. So it's absolutely fine, no problem at all. Um, so yeah, so don't don't worry about that. So uh, yeah, whew, that was good. We had a good old run. We had some excellent uh, discussion and comments there. Thank you very much for that. I will be here at seven o'clock. I'm sorry about being a few minutes late. And then they deleted my post just so it's a few minutes late. Honestly, I'd better go and check on the potatoes and the children. And I will be back ten uh, seven o'clock. Tuesday night, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, thank you, Zoe, and good night to you too. Good night, everyone.